All right, so flies. I love this picture. Can you get it? Despite everyone's best effort, the bees talk quickly for a minute. Because they're being fly traps. OK. Um, we are only covering three types of flies. I do believe Dr. Bader covers more. OK? But for the purpose of this lab, we're going to cover what I consider the most three, the three most common, all right, that you may see, especially um, in small animals, you'll absolutely see these in large animals if you work around, if you hang around long enough. All right, so Cochleomyo homnivorax. All right, it's a screw worm. Okay, is this grossing you out already, or is it? No, it's spelling. Oh, yeah, I know. Oh, yay, yay, <laughs> spelling. Okay. So these little buggers um, will attack anywhere. You'll find that some of these flies prefer tissue that's damaged, okay? It's already broken down, it's easy to invade. These guys will get healthy tissue too. So they are not intimidated by a cowhide of leather. They will just burrow right through that, okay? So um, these are all spread by a fly that then lands on the animal, lays its eggs. The eggs grow into a larvae inside the animal and then pop out. Okay, don't worry, I have videos. So first off, the adult females are attracted to wounds, okay, because that's already been broken down for them, it's easy to enter. They also like the umbilical area of a newborn, okay? So when um, our baby animals are born, they typically have the umbilical cord that's still hanging off for a while, and then once it falls off, there's that little opening. That's where they like to hang, uh, to attack already open for them. But that doesn't stop them. If nothing's open, they will still burrow through leather. Okay? So these flies are going to lay like a cream-colored egg around the edges of the wound, and then as those hatch, the little worms move in and then burrow into the animal. Yuck. Okay. There's what I just said. And um, they can cause a lot of damage because this one migrates quite a bit. Some of them that we're about to, I'll about to show you, it makes its little breathing hole and live there. This one can migrate though. So let's say the tissue starts to heal or maybe the tissue becomes necrotic where it's dying. Um, and the worm is like, oh, I need, or the larvae is like, I need some more fresh meat, <laughs> essentially. It will move, okay, and then keep feeding off its host. So once they're mature, they drop off onto the ground and then they molt into their fly form. Okay? And they do tend to have like a greener color. You can't really see it in this picture because it's not from behind, but this is the uh, rendering of what it looks like as an adult. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So you've already got a wound that's bad and it's in a large animal that's typically outside. Um, and large animals, when they are hurting, they tend to withdraw from the herd. So sometimes if you're not paying really close attention, it can be hard to find. But it just prevents the wound from healing even more. All right, we do report this one. We do report this one. Okay. All right, so now let's talk about Cooterebra, or our bot flies. All right, Cooterebra. These are common. You've seen some in practice, Gretchen? Oh yes. my gosh, they're so cool, right? I mean, I think they're cool. They're disgusting, but very cool. Two in a jar. Yeah? Whoa. Are you trying to grow them like into something? Or, oh, okay. I had a coworker that found one and tried to grow it in meat. Like she embedded it in some raw meat and was trying to grow it. Now she got her bachelor's in bugs. So what is that, an entomologist? Yeah. Um, but yeah, you find on the animal, they'll have like a little pore but it's about ish big, so I mean a big pore. And you're just like, what? what is that? That's strange. There's like a blowhole on the side of this dog, all right? And then you might see this little thing poke its head up and then go back in. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness. What? Y'all put stuff in it? I've got a really good video of them pulling one out of a cat's nose. Okay, so anyways, we see these, yeah, we see these a lot in rabbits. Okay, especially people who have their rabbits in the backyard in hutches, we will see this a lot because the rabbits can't get away from the flies, especially if the conditions are less than ideal. So absolutely, people bring in rabbits. That was where I saw my first handful of these guys. Um, 
Then dogs and cats that go outdoors, I feel like are the next kind of most common. Um, mice, typically, these guys are about as big as the mice and it doesn't end well for the mouse. Uh, rats are becoming, well, not becoming, they've been a very popular pet, but you have to work at a vet that would have, you know, that. And typically rats are kept indoors and it's a little less common for them to get this. But, all right, so the eggs are laid and then the larvae burrow into the skin. So they really like the upper area, okay, of their host. The neck is a beautiful place. It's also got a lot of stretchy skin, right? And so then around the face, like I said, I think this is the one that has the cat. Sorry, I didn't get a chance to watch all the videos before class to remind myself, but I know one of these, I have a cat one. So the larvae are creamy in color. Sorry to use that word. That should be reserved for like Alfredo sauce, creamy. But that is kind of what they're colored to a gray color. Okay, I wouldn't quite call it white. I wouldn't call it yellow. It's, it's honestly kind of like an Alfredo creamy uh, color. So uh, they become black, really dark, as they move to their last stage, okay, right before they molt into the fly. So there's that little tiny hole that you'd see, and you're almost like, what, what, what is that? And it's not always moist like that. There we go, Linnet. It. Oh, it's peeking out. Hello. Hello. Peekaboo. Uh, you see how the animal's kind of swollen to the, um, on the screen to the right? That's where it is under the skin, okay? They don't go horribly deep, but I mean, they're a couple of layers deep. You have to be very careful with removing these because you don't want it to rupture. So you'll pull a little ways and then you'll pull a little more. Yeah, I, I don't think they got it out in one pull, though. I more like that video because of the way the pore looks. Let me show you this next one. I just, this is the one with the cat's nose. I have to sign in to confirm my age. Oh my gosh, that's funny. All right. Let's see it. It's a good video. How does, how does it know my age with my email? get our bearings with this video. There is the cat's nose. Okay, so it's upside down. Its oh, eyes are down here, this is the jaw, and that's the neck. So it's laying like this, right? Oh. Okay, and they're in the neck. All right, um, that is probably an ice cube or some sort of like moisturizer type thing that they're using. Some people will put, um, they'll kind of lubricate it with some vegetable oil or some, um, you know, also the cold makes it kind of move around a little more so yeah. but this cat is under sedation it's not that don't worry you you can't pop it like a pimple unfortunately you have to pull a little bit because the little bugger, the hole is not as big as his body is wide. And this is really the proper way. I mean, see how slow they're going and they're just kind of inching him out. There we go. Look at that. Yikes! Yeah, they'll, they'll usually will move. There it goes! <laughs> Yuck. Oh, so look at that hole! I mean, that's crazy! Yeah, I, they'll, it'll scar. It'll scar. So the body is a miraculous healer, and uh, we definitely don't stitch it closed. We want to leave that open and just kind of let it heal from the outside, but usually there will be scar tissue and you'll always feel the lump there. Um, they'll definitely flush it just to make sure that little termite type thing has not left anything behind. 
All right, so um, the reason why it is so important to remove them whole, okay, is that if these little guys break apart, they release a toxin, okay? And it's part of their, um, uh, like a protective mechanism of the bug, all right? So it can cause an anaphylaxis reaction if they break apart and if the body responds to it, okay? Hopefully if you break it apart and you're able to get out the parts and you flush the site quick enough, then the animal will most likely be fine. However, if it gets, broken apart and the body starts reacting to it, it can produce an anaphylactic reaction, all right? Which for anyone who's not um, had a family member with something like that or a friend, it's essentially your airway tightens up and swells and breathing is very difficult and you need epinephrine or some sort of steroid to get your body going again and be able to breathe properly. It can cause death like that. Um, so that's why we don't want to try and squeeze it out. We try and just pull it out all right um, and then yes it talks about flushing it like I was saying just to make sure it hasn't left behind any residual stuff there's also a little bit of a slime I feel like that comes out with them yes you could it's a good question you could probably just pull them out because of the disgusting idea of it, you know? Um, in the old days when, uh, well this one's our dog and cat one, it's the next one that we would pop out with a, yeah, this one. Um, these guys are very similar, but when they make their little breathing hole, uh, ranchers used to just come along with an old uh, soda pop bottle, and they would put the bottle on the cow and like rock over it, and it would boop into the soda pop bottle. Like it had to be a glass bottle, and they would do that. And I've always wondered if you could just do that with a kudu ibra. Um, that's a really good question of why not just leave it until it falls out. I'm trying to think through like possible scenarios. If it falls out and drops, then he's a fly. You potentially start laying eggs and you risk, you know, more. Um, you risk the animal scratching and rupturing the kudu ibra and having the uh, anaphylaxis reaction. How long will they have it? The body should start to close it from the inside out. Uh, but I anticipate there will always be scar tissue. I've actually never seen one of my patients that we removed one back in the office. Have you ever seen one? Honestly, no. I've never seen one again to be able to follow up and be like, what did it feel like after? Um, but yeah, you definitely don't want to stitch it closed because anytime you have an open wound that has had some sort of healing. Um, so for those of you that had me for intro, we talked a little bit about the stages of healing. That as soon as there's a break in the skin, the body starts healing. It's what we call first intention healing. And once first intention healing has occurred, and we move on to second, you never stitch it up. If you're going to, you have to cut brand new margins and then stitch it up. So we would literally have to cut a V and cut that whole thing out and then stitch it together, which you can do because the neck has stretchy skin. So potentially you could do that. But honestly, it should just knot up and with scar tissue and, and close from the inside out. How long does the larva stay there? Usually, it's a, usually up to a week around that time frame. So, yeah. I'd have to look for the exact time. That's a good question. Let me write that down. I want to find that out for sure. Because then it's like, well, if you choose to leave it in, how long are you, is your pet going to have this little friend? For the toxins, that you said you released, is that like all the bottom notes? Um, I, did, it, I just said that it's yeah. anaphylaxis reaction. I didn't say what toxin. But yeah, that blank is on the bottom notes. Okay. So yeah, if you guys, yeah. like if you're clicking on these, see the words are down there. All right. So let's keep talking. So now we've got hypoderma linatum. Okay, this is a warble. And you guys, these common names are extremely important because if you're talking to any large animal people, they are not gonna know the scientific name, it's gonna be the common name, okay? Not that they're less smart or something, it's just everything is known by the common name. It's a whole different lingo when you work out with farm ranch people. Uh, I love it, they're just so much more laid back, <laughs> I feel like. 
But anyways, um, these are cattle grubs, all right? So it's got two common names. It's a warble, also known as a cattle grub. Uh, they lay their uh, eggs on the legs, okay? And they're like a yellowish color, okay? Fun story, here at school, our horses uh, had some actually. And as we're going to do our palpation exam at the end of the first year, which I'm not a huge fan of horses. I mean, I love horses, but I just don't trust them yet. Like I can't read them as well as I can read a really angry cat, right? So I'm going to do my palpation exam and I'm already a little nervous and I get down to the legs and I see these eggs and then the ick factor kicked in, you know, and I'm like, I have to touch where the eggs are. And thankfully, Dr. I took pity on me and she's like, here, identify something else for me. And so she let me find something else on the horse because I think she could see me being like, uh, it's just the idea first off of having to, to mess with the horse's leg because I didn't think he liked me. Horses are very smart. They can sense when you're not comfortable around them, just like cats. Uh, but then to see this in addition, woo um, But they are much more common in our cattle, okay? And there it said, it talked about the popping them out with a soda bottle. So you have to think of like a glass bottle and it's that opening that's perfect. Um, all right, so the biggest problem with this is how it affects the purpose of our cattle, right? So we use cattle for meat primarily, okay? Then we also use them for milk, and we also use them for their hides, right? Well, first off, their hide is being destroyed, okay? It's being turned into Swiss cheese, all right? Um, also, it's going to stress the animal out to have these because very rarely do they have just one. They're going to have multiple. These are typically very surface level, but they can migrate. Okay, so they can dip down into some of the meat parts that we would eat. Plus there's quite a bit, um, especially with ribs, beef ribs and all that, that's fairly surface level that these guys like to invade and then that messes up uh, sale uh, prices for the rancher, okay? So this can definitely cut into his bottom line if he has a problem with these. So how do we treat them? Same thing, that Ghostbuster pack, spray on the top. Um, I love this video, it's very long. We're not gonna watch all of it, but I love it too, because it's so old. But there's a part in it where the little things are popping out. Okay, so you see all the little spots. gets that dark color too right before it pops out so I know you all want to see that again and that's got to feel weird for the cow is there what no there should only be one per four yeah it's probably that kind of gunk that we see with the cudibra stands in. I mean these guys have to defecate some way so it's got to be in their little pore but yeah, this whole video is really interesting. Plus, I love anything that like a British person narrates. So here it is hatching. Do you hear that? 400 eggs carried by each female. It's very interesting. Like, if you have any interest in bugs. No. <laughs> what does it look like to you guys? A bee, a honeybee. Yeah, it looks just like one. There he is helping to to. Um, Until recent times, only one method of control was available. And this is also the way um, these cows are lined up. That's how they do it to treat them. What I was saying about putting them in a shoot lineup sort of thing. Right. I don't think there's any more where they now they're just pouring on the solution. But yeah, that's the best part where you see it pop out. Oh, do it again. Oh, that is funny. That twitching is the cow, by the way, not the bugs. On reaching maturity, the larva or grub forces itself out through the hole in the skin and falls to the ground. During the latter half of March, throughout April, May, and early June, there is a steady succession of these grubs leaving the hosts they have thrived on for so long. The life cycle is now nearly complete. 
Boom. So now's the time to be watching those cattle as you guys are doing kennel duty. <laughs> Seeing if there's any out there. Yes, ma'am. So the gunk that gets left behind where the hole that where the barber is, does that cause any other issues or does that just kind of leak out? It should leak out a little bit, but the body's going to treat it as an invader. And so white blood cells will go to that area. Usually it'll kind of turn like a pussy color, purely urulent uh, discharge, where it's kind of got a yellowish tint to it. Um, I mean, ideally, all those holes would be flushed, but it's a very different world in yeah. you know, cattle production. So the rain will help a little bit with that. Um, but I mean, you can see how that's ruined the hide. There's no use for that hide after this. And I sure wouldn't want to eat a cow that <laughs> you know, had those friends. Um, there shouldn't be any kind of reaction for the pet though, like an anaphylaxis reaction for the animal, excuse me. Okay. But yeah, Ugh. I'm really curious now too, what exactly is all that that's left behind? Does the animal, the little grub defecate? Anyway, some good thought, food for thought. Um, bad choice of words, right? <laughs> all right, so let's move right on to lice, okay? Um, it's going to make you itchy, sorry guys, it always makes me itchy, just reading about it to prep for today was Alright, so first off, we have two different types of lice, two categories. We have the kind that chew the skin, alright, and then we have the kind that suck, okay? Not necessarily blood, these are not vampires, but um, they'll suck lymph fluid and things like that. They have, they will suck blood if they get deep enough, but... Um, what's interesting is that lice, they don't have wings, so they do not fly, okay? They also do not jump. They're just moving by direct contact to different hosts, okay? And they will stay on that host their entire life, all right? So until that host is either treated or dies, they're there, all right? Um, it's very hard to find lice in many of our animals. Why do you think? Hair. Absolutely, just like it is with people. The hair, it hides. And also, the hair on these animals is usually more coarse and the color of the lice, I think I heard you say color, the lice blends really, really well. At least with human head lice, they're white, right? So typically, people don't have white hair and it kind of stands out. But sometimes if you have someone with really blonde hair, it blends in. So this is All right, so what you're looking at here, of goat lice. She does a fairly good job narrating it, so I am going to leave the volume on. It's actually a live, a louse. Um, it's just one of the little mites that grow on, um, so it's an external parasite. As you can see, the hair around it's kind of shaggy. It's got some dead, coarse hair and a little bit of dandruff. Um, we've already warmed these girls once. And that's with the warmer that takes care of external parasites as well. Um, but you do, you repeat it in 10 days and then another 10 days after that. So that's but look that. how hard see that over here doesn't look as bad um, from the surface area. But a lot of the girls, when um, they get real bad infestations, you can see them, they look start, start looking real shaggy. So. one of the teachers brought up chickens, I think it was. It was some farm animal. And they all had lice. Maybe it was pigs. And so it was really great because I got to class and there was like a jar sitting on the desk and it was, we found lice. And I was <laughs> like, yes! <laughs> we can all see live lice. Uh, but so far this year, that has not happened. Okay, so let's start with talking about the chewing lice. You just need to know that uh, Demolina species Okay, um, as you can see, there's specific types of parasites for each species, but I don't want you to learn all of those, just learn species, all right? Um, these can also infect dogs and cats, but it's a lot less common. Pediculosis, what do you guys think pediculosis means? That's a good, that's a good thought, yeah. She's thinking feet, it's not though. That's a really good guess. It means a lice infestation. So if you say this animal is suffering from pediculosis, it's a lice infestation. And usually that term is much kinder to use around clients or in the hallways, okay, than saying, oh, we've got a lice infestation in room two. <laughs> Doc, I think we have pediculosis. Let's grab some gloves. 
Okay, it's a lot nicer to say. Um, it does cause itching because a lot of our large animals are the ones getting it. You're going to see rubbing on things, especially trees. Again, these guys also like the cooler weather. So, any differences between our sucking and our chewing? Oh, Look at the head. The, yep, very good. Look at the head. See that? Because the coloring may just be how the image was taken, right? So you definitely want to look at the placement of the arms, okay? The width of the arms and the head. <laughs> I think they kind of look like grenades. Like, ooh. All right. So the sucking lice. Okay, we have on here that they're usually more pathogenic than chewing lice. Pathogenic usually means bad for the animal. Why do you guys think that they would be worse? Yeah, they're, they're drinking out something from the animal. Okay, so I've got two species there. I'm not going to make y'all memorize this. Okay, the main thing I want you to actually learn is this one because I think it will benefit you in life. <laughs> learn what the human head lice one is. Okay? Ridiculous humanus. 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 However you'd like to pronounce that. Um, all right. So there's a picture of sucking lice. Sucking lice are going to attach and stay. You saw how that chewing lice was moving around. All right? Our sucking lice, they don't benefit as much from that. Okay? They can find a good source of nutrients and stay there. Stay hunkered down. All right, so how do we control them? Uh, porons, again, can absolutely be used, but more commonly, we're gonna deworm internally, and it's also gonna take care of external parasites, just like we have with dogs and cats, okay? Um, again, we have to think about withdrawal times because these are food animals that we're using it on, okay? When in doubt, if there's a drug and it's like uh, used on cattle, should you worry about withdrawal times? Yeah, say yes. <laughs> All right, if it's something we could potentially eat, worry about withdrawal times. And again, where do we find the withdrawal time information? On the bottom. On the bottom. Or usually there's a drug insert, a little piece of paper. That's, if you unfold it, it's like ridiculously oh, big. Like yeah, and it's in multiple languages, and you yeah. really need a magnifying glass to read it. Um, but that's going to be folded up in this itty bit, a little, little deceptive small fold yeah. and tucked inside the bottle. Okay. Same with children's bottles. Oh, yeah? Well, yeah. That's like all the legal stuff that they have to share. Just in case. And they wrap it like three times. <laughs> All right. Any questions? Yes. It's why I hope I can answer come off at work. Uh -huh. A lady called me and she's like, my friend's dog is just over here and evidently they have lice. Mm -hmm. Can my dog get it? And I was like, yes. Mm -hmm. And then she's like, well, can I get it? And I was like, it's a different species. Yeah. However, it could go on you. And then, mm -hmm. I don't know, because like, I learned that if you put tea tree oil, it can ward it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, would you be able to do this dog? So I told her, I was like, you can try it. Then I was like thinking about, I was like, crap, what if the dog can drink tea tree oil or something? Right. Um, yes, tea tree oil is a common thing for any of our ectoparasites, parasites. And it makes the dog smell quite pleasant, I think. Uh, but yeah, also, I told her, I was like, I just put it, because I'll put it in my kid's hair every now and then. Yeah. Just in case kids grow up. Just in case. Yeah. Um, so the questions are a dog came over that had lice and then their dog was having a play date or something, can the other dog get it? Absolutely, absolutely, yes. Um, what should the owner do? And a lot of times owners have already consulted Dr. Google, and Dr. Google has told them various things that they can do, um, which nothing wrong with that. I usually will say, if you'd like to try that, you're more than welcome to, um, but I always recommend that you come in and see the veterinarian because we may have a shorter way to cure your animal, you know, faster way because we have a specific medication that can treat and be done, right? Instead of, oh, let's try one thing, let's try something else, and let's try something else. Um, there's some thing that is used on large animals and it's some sort of salve or cream type thing that's purple. And it's very common south in Mexico and South America. And I've seen little chihuahuas come in that are just purple <laughs> from this stuff. And the owners are like, it's just not working. And, and then now they have to buy medication and they have a purple dog. So I don't think there's any harm in telling owners, you know, yeah, you're welcome to try that. 
But, I mean, a good rule of thumb, just to cover yourself, is to tell them to come in, especially if they know the other pet had it. The likelihood is, is astronomical that yeah, your pet has also yeah, got it. Like, should I come in? Yeah. Wait? And I was mm -hmm. like, well, I told her, like, Carson's appointment. She's yeah. Like, oh, wait. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then if they're worried about themselves getting it, that is a very fair question. I do not answer those. Um, now, if there's a case where I do know it is zoonotic, like hookworms or something like that, you know, without a doubt, then I'll be like, yes, but with these lice, over the phone, how in the world do you know what species? You don't know what type. And also, I learned, um, we don't know the history of the family. Like, there was one where the animal had ringworm, and I said, oh, yes, that is zoonotic, because it is, right? Um, and she was like, well, I think I'll probably be okay. And I said, yeah, some people have a natural immunity, some don't didn't know that the aunt was living with them who's getting chemotherapy. Oh, Woo, God. down goes your immune system. Oh, God. Mom comes in and she's like, my sister is covered in ringworm. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I, said, I mean, how in the world would we have known, right? So usually if I, you know, I say that is a very fair question. I would worry about that too. I would consult your doctor. We just don't treat people. We're, we're not familiar with that without, especially without knowing the exact species of, of louse and also, it's going to be hard for us to identify species, it. So. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's a good thing to honestly give them questions back, you know. Do you have a doctor that you can call? So, um, yep. All right, anyone else? Good questions. Again, I am not a bug person, so I, my knowledge is limited on bugs. Uh, also, they make me itchy, and I don't want to become a bug person, but uh, definitely... If you have a pet that you are treating in your clinic with something like this, wear gloves and wash your arms or grab a jacket or something. You know. Do you forget to wear gloves? No, I wore gloves, but I probably can't take out my arm. 